All right, good morning, everyone, uh, and good morning to you, our students who are online as well. Okay, let's begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our teaching session. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for yet another new week that you have blessed us with. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come and sit at your feet and to learn and to meditate on your word, of God. We pray that even as we learn about the local church, Pray, God, that you give us the grace, you will give us wisdom, you will give us insights, oh God, to understand everything that we learn and to apply it in our lives, in our local churches. Oh God, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Online. Okay, everyone can hear me okay? Now? Yes. All right. Okay, so last class we uh, did a bit of chapter th chapter three, and then we did chapter four as well. Uh, chapter four, we looked at the different stages. We looked at the uh, stages of growth: pioneering stage, administrative stage, pastoral stage, equipping stage. Uh, did we get into the apostolic uh, function stage? Not yet, right? Okay, so we'll just pick up from there, and then we'll uh, we'll get into the next chapter. So, uh, the apostolic function stage. Now, even as a church, uh, there will come a time when we will move to this apostolic stage. Now, the apostolic stage is is a is an outward stage. It's more of doing something outside than focusing on inside. Remember the initial stages. You know, you're focusing on the church. You're focusing on raising up leaders. Your, uh, you know, the teams within the church. You're focus focusing as a church, as an organization. You're building it up. But there will come a time in the local church when, you know, the senior pastor or the pastoral team will be more towards going out, reaching out. Right. This could be missions. It could be um, a place of, uh, you know, building, building people all across. The nation wherever your church is planted right so it's mostly going to be like a mission space right so again it's not necessary that i have to wait through all the stages and only then get into an apostolic stage right so it could be that god can use a church even five years ten years down the line to be apostolic in nature right uh, but the church begins to actively reproduce itself itself in regions beyond where it is currently uh, located and so as pastors as leaders how do we lead this congregation through all of these stages right now when you start off you start off small you have to be able to minister to people one on one right you have to be able to be there be physically present Right? You can't say, I'll meet you on Zoom every time. No, right? because the church is still small. You're just starting off, so you've got to be there. And as the church grows, you and I have to learn to move people forward in the local church. Right? That's what the church is all about. I have to move people forward. I cannot stay in the same place. Right? So here are a few pointers. Uh, to help us as a local church to move from strength to strength, to grow from strength to strength, right? Number one is constantly move people forward, point people to where they should go. You and I as a leader must point people, meaning, okay, now we are in 2024. In 2030, this is where we should be. In numbers, in our spiritual maturity, in our walk with God, uh, as a church, as an organization, this is where we should be. So point people to that. How do I do that? Keep reiterating the vision. Keep reiterating why you're doing church. Right? What is the basis of what you're doing? Uh, we have to remind people that we have to move up to new levels. Right? We cannot stay in the same level. 
if we are satisfied in the same level, then we're not going to grow as a church. So we need to tell people that. Right? If I want to, what did Jesus do? Perfect example. He trained the disciples. He said, okay, now you go. You go because eventually I'm not going to be there. And when you go, you go, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, do everything that I did in the ministry. Right? So we need to move people forward when it comes to ministry. Secondly, bridging across two levels. Right? We must intentionally, we must be intentional about stretching people spiritually to the next level. So if there is a church, you start off by giving them the milk of God's word, meaning it's still small, babies in Christ. And they're learning. You give them the milk. But there'll come a time you have to step it up. You have to, you know, get into some of the details. Right? So, for example, you start off with grace, faith, the love of God, all of that. And then the next stage, you get into, uh, you know, maybe talking about the book of Acts. Right? Okay. So, the first, second missionary journey. Then you go into maybe talking about the epistles, the Roman epistles, the epistles that Paul wrote. And so you're picking it up. You're not staying at the same level, right? Paul writes to the Corinthians, what does he say? You are still drinking milk. You are supposed to be eating food. He's talking about spiritual food. You all are flowing in the gifts of the Spirit, but you are still drinking milk. You are behaving like, you know, with quarrels and all of that happening within the church. You all need to step up. Right? So when we bridge across one, one level to another, right, we do it step by step. Right? So we don't take somebody and say, hey, you become you just become a believer. Come, let's learn the end times. Will it make sense to him? Yes or no? Right? It won't. It, 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 it. So he's just become a believer. You have to take him through that steps. There's a season. Okay, you learn these, then you slowly, you know, bring him to another level. And as you're bridging that gap, bridging across two levels, you do it intentionally, but you do it patiently. We'll be patient also. Right? Sometimes the mistake we made is we want to raise up leaders, we want to raise up people, and in a hurry we give them everything. You sit, you, you have to do this. Right? And sometimes they're not able to grasp everything that people are saying. Remember Paul, what does he say? He says, I have so much to write about, but uh, there's so much I can tell that I, you know, that I, when I went to the third heavens, but I, I cannot say it and there's so much that I want to say, but you are not ready for it yet. Right? So when you are bridging across two levels, the way you do ministry when the church is 50 people and the way you do ministry when the church is 150 people has to change. You understand, right? You get that. So you have to learn to bridge those two levels. And then there will be times of change, right? How do you lead change? Uh, meaning when we know it's time to transition, we as leaders, we must step up as leaders to help the congregation to change. Now, here's the thing with change. Some people like change. Some people don't like change. How many of you like to like change? You know, you 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 like change. <laughs> For me, sometimes I don't like change because I like to do something certain way, and I it's it's a habit, and I like it that way. Especially when it comes to my personal routine. Okay, go to sleep at this time, wake up at this time, read your Bible, pray at this time. Now, uh, and so your routine is all set, right? Sometimes. When it, when it comes to a church setting and when there's a change, especially change in things we do or change in leadership, we as leaders must help others to change. Now, let me give you an example. You know, we, were, we used to meet APC East. We used to meet at a, at a hotel, right? Now, this is a nice place, nice hotel. Right? And we've made, been meeting there for about, I think, six to seven years. 
But there came a time after COVID, you know, there was problems. So the AC had to be repaired and all of that. And uh, um, so we bought some fans, standing fans. It didn't work out. So we said, okay, let's look out for a new place. So when we look out for a new place, we got a good place, but it was, you know, about five or six kilometers away from there. Right. But it was a very good place. All that we need, you know, parking, good hall, big hall, um, you know, place for children's church. Everything was suitable for us. So we said, okay, we'll go ahead with it. Now, some of them in the church were not too happy. Some of them were very happy. Right. Now, as a leader, we must be able to handle these things. Right? We need to explain. We need to inform the church. See, the reason we're moving is because of this. It may be the distance is a little away, but we have everything that we need in one place. Right? Children's church, main church, right? Uh, and then, uh, you know, well, car parking, everything that we need is there. Right? So remember, change is something that People will like, people may not like. It's all about how we handle it as leaders. right? Now, you can't change people's mind. You can't change people's reactions to what happens. right? But you can only you know, let them know. Let them know that it's good for the church, it's good for the people, it's good for the congregation, it's good for leadership. Right? And you step on, you move out, right? you do what you have to do. Right? Help people prepare for change. Don't assume that people, okay, just because we changed, people will you know, accept it. Don't assume that. You have to help people. Get the right people in the right place at the right time. We talked about this, right? When it comes to a church, uh, especially when it comes to leadership, get the right people at the right place at the right time. Now, the question is, who is the right people? When is the right place and when is the right time? Or where is the right place and when is the right time? Right? That's a question that we can ask. Who's the right people? How do we know that this person can do well? You give the opportunity. If you don't give an opportunity, how will we know it? That you give opportunities, right? And at the right time, as leaders, the Lord will minister to us and he will tell us, okay, uh, choose this person. Or put this person here, volunteer team, make him as a leader, make her as a leader, give them opportunity in prayer, leading the prayer, or give this person opportunity in declaration. Right? So you you put the right people at the right place at the right time. That is a very important role as leaders. Right? And then even as you give leadership, transition with them. Right? So you give the leadership, you 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 stay with them, right? Talk to them mentor them, lead them. And then there will come a time then you know that, OK, they're able to handle whatever responsibilities they have. They have. They're able to handle it. Then you take a step back. Right? But you're still there. right? Then adapting to changes, to the changes of new levels. Now, each time you transition into a new level of growth, there will be new kinds of challenges. Higher the growth. Higher the challenges, higher the responsibilities. Here is where we tap into the wisdom of God. Solomon was the king of Israel. Now, everyone loved David as a king. And, oh, David, he did some good things. Now, his son has come. Solomon, he's, he's, he's you know, he's, the kingdom is doing well. He wants to build the temple. He's built the temple. And he asked God for wisdom. And God was very pleased with that because he understood that if he has wisdom, he'll get everything else. And of course, he had a lot of moral failures in his life, but he tapped into the wisdom of God as a king. Now, you and I have the spirit of wisdom with us. What are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? One of them is the spirit of wisdom. So God will tell us how to handle the situation. Okay, there's a situation that's come. God tells us how to handle it. So we go back to God. God, how do I handle this situation? This is a problem now that I'm facing. How do I handle it? Give me the wisdom. Right? Or you, know, you have to make a decision. Right? Uh, maybe choosing a leader or doing a, some kind of transition in the church. Lord, I need your wisdom. Now, the responsibility of tapping into that is ours. Right? 
we have to pray and ask God, God, give me the wisdom. Should I take this step? Is this the right person? Is this the right time to do this? Is this the right place? Do we have the uh, finances? Is it the right time to do the conference? Give me the wisdom. Right? Of course, you know, God also gives us, you know, uh, we also need to think for ourselves. Right? So, for example, we want to do a conference. You want to do an outdoor conference. Obviously, you don't choose rainy seasons. So you avoid rainy season. Now, don't go and do a big outdoor meeting and during the rainy season. And then it rains and it says, God, what is this? You know, it rained. God, how will I see? I spent so much money, LED screen, stage, you know, a big meeting, but now it rains. So we need to be wise also, no? Choose summer season, do it in summer. Right? So it's it's simple. But even as we adapt to these challenges, learn to tap into the wisdom of God. Right? If you move your congregation into becoming more prophetic, to hear from God, do and speak what God is saying, uh, you know, uh, use godly counsel, teach your congregation how to step into the prophetic, how to hear from God. Um, and as you lead into these stages, it's beautiful. It's it's a very good learning. Right? As leaders, you will be encouraged. You know, how many you all went for the upper room, the worship evening time? The students didn't go. Okay. Uh, so in the upper room, you know, we used to have this, uh, you know, uh, worship evenings many many years back. I'm talking about two thousand and. 10, 10 onwards, very frequently we used to have worship evenings. And I remember going for some of these worship evenings, and there would be 10, 15 people at times, right? Uh, and sometimes 20 or 30 people, very few people would come because it's, you know, uh, it used to be six hours of worship, but worship, prayer, worship, prayer. And so, you know, over time, we've seen the congregation growing in terms of our, in terms of spirituality, right? In terms of uh, the word and uh, worship, prophetic, all of these things. So now we see that the church is more interested and when it comes to events, conferences. They're willing to come. They're willing to spend a day with us. They're willing to spend time with us. And so, uh, you know. Uh, recently in the upper room, there were about 600 people who came for the worship evening, three hours of worship. Now, that's a big deal because I know that, you know, b b before uh, people used to, it, it was not easy. Right? People wouldn't come. Uh, but we thank God that God is moving now. And so as leaders, we also must be able to, right, right the responsibility is more now. Right? So we need to be able to impart to people. Uh, uh, in however way that the Holy Spirit leads us in, right? Uh, so let's get into chapter five. This is a very important chapter. Now, what we'll do is we're just going to, I'm just going to go a little quick so that, uh, you know, we are able to finish the portions on time. There are some places I will explain. There are some places I, I, I'll just go quickly, uh, deliberately, right? But you can feel free to ask questions at any time. So what makes a strong local church? You know, we want to start a local church or plant a local church. What makes it strong? How do we make that local church strong? Right? Before we focus on becoming a large congregation, we must focus to become a strong local church. Again, we talked about this, right? The foundation is what matters. The higher the building, deeper the foundation. You want to build 20 floors, you go down 40 feet. You want to build 40 floors, you go down 80 feet. Example, right? You just, the higher you go, the deeper your foundation should be. So if you're looking at a church to have about, say, for example, 5,000 people in your church, imagine the foundation that you'll have to make, right? So before focusing on numbers, you got to focus on quality. Because quality is better than quantity. Right? Everyone with me? Right? Quality is better than quantity. Now, 
here are some of the important characteristics of a strong local church. Number one, a church where there is strong leadership with a God-given vision. Strong leadership. That's the key. When you have strong leadership, and this leadership is walking with the vision that God has given, it makes a strong local church. Right? Leadership is the key to a strong local church. Right? Here uh, in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. You can somebody read that, please? Proverbs 29 and 18. In the meanwhile, I'll read Matthew 15, 14. Jesus is talking to the to those who are listening to him, and he's saying, if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. So he's talking to the Pharisees and he's he's implying it to them, and he's saying, the blind will lead the blind. They're both going to fall into a ditch. If I, as a leader, don't have a vision, a God-given vision for the church, where am I leading the others to? Because I am blind. I'm just saying, hey, come along. Come along, be part of church. And do what? Just come every Sunday. Okay, I'll come. Do what? You praise, you know, worship and re listen to the word. Okay. But what is happening? He, the, that person is just coming, but there is no vision. There's no focus. There's no, okay, hey, uh, you know, now we always reiterate, we are, you are the, uh, we are the salt and light to the city of Bangalore. So every time uh, on Sunday when we play that announcement, hey, we are the salt and light. So wherever I am, I'm called to be the salt and light. Right? And so even as leaders, we, we always think, okay, if God has called us to this ministry, this is the vision to be salt and light to the city to the voice to the nation and to the nations. So I can't do this on my own. I need to be able to work as a team. I need to have strong leadership skills, right? And a church with, where there is strong leadership is a really strong church because, you know, they're all together. All the leaders are in one mind, in unity, walking with, walking in oneness, with one focus, with one goal, with one passion and zeal to build God's kingdom. Right? So let's read that. Proverbs 29, 18. Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Mm. But blessed is who keeps the law. Where there is no revelation, people are... Yeah. Where there is no revelation, there is no, there's no goal. There's no outcome, right? So very important, right? This mark this, a church where there is strong leadership with a God-given vision. When you raise up leaders, learn to invest in those leaders and learn to share the vision that God has put in your heart, right? Don't be selfish leaders who say, no, this is my vision. I am going to do it. Uh, you all just you know, help me out. No. It's a vision that God has given. You, what is your vision? You've got to make it others as well. That is, the, strong, that is you know, the strongest thing a leader can do. You take your vision and make it others also. Right? Two, a church where there is balanced emphasis on the word and the spirit. Right? Now, this is, again, very important. You have the teaching of the Word, and you have the working of the Holy Spirit. And we, are, we ought to balance them. So we're not going extreme in either of them. We're not saying, no, I will preach only the Word. Is it good? Yes, Word is very important. But I cannot deny the working of the miracles, working of the Holy Spirit, right? because the Holy Spirit comes with gifts. And one of the aspects of the Holy Spirit is to do miracles. So I cannot deny that and say, no, I'm only going to focus on the Word. No, i got to learn to balance both of them. Right? How do I balance them? Right? Something that we do in APC is we have, if there are four Sundays, three Sundays we have preaching of the Word, the word, the ministry. And then the fourth Sunday we have uh, a supernatural Sunday. So we pray for people who are sick, who need a miracle, all of it. So balanced emphasis. Right. Weekend school. 
So sometimes it's the whole weekend school is full of teaching, but some of the weekend schools are example prophetic uh, understanding the prophetic healing and deliverance that's coming up we we teach and then we exercise that and we say okay now if anyone needs healing anyone wants to flow in the prophetic let's do this together let's pray together so this balance is very important let's read acts 20 and 32 this is paul he's meeting the believers in ephesus for the last time and he's and this is what he's saying acts 20 32 Go ahead, read it. X twenty thirty two. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Yes. Now I commit you to the word of God that is able to, the word of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance. So Paul is saying, Stick to the word. Many places Paul has said, preach the word. But we also see an emphasis on the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? So what are the five areas we focus on as a local church to strengthen the local church right? in both the word and the spirit? First one, evangelism. Right? We, we encourage evangelism. We encourage people to go out on ministries. We have youth teams that go out. We have... Uh, you know, we have a few uh, men who go out on uh, prayer walks and some way we encourage evangelism. Discipleship, right? Discipleship, again, is very important. We, we want to disciple one another. We have our life groups where there is discipleship happening. Uh, then there's mentoring also that is happening. Then prayer and worship. So we have the five days of prayer. We had uh, upper room, three hours of prayer. Then even towards the end of this year, we will have another five days of prayer early, mostly uh, uh, either February or March. We'll have 21 days of fasting and prayer. So you see there's this balance, right? And we keep it open. We invite our church folks to come. Now, we do understand that many of them are working, working professionals. They may not come. But we also, you know, now, now what we're doing is we are opening it up on Zoom so they can join online wherever they are. And uh, and so over the years, we've had good participation. People have been, you know, even praying on Zoom. And uh, so as a church, we're growing together in prayer and worship. And then there's fellowship. Again, uh, a lot of events that, that are there, youth meetings, men's ministry, women's ministry, uh, life groups, conferences. All of these help in building fellowship. Right? And fellowship is important. Why? Because, see, we must understand that as a church is growing, the pastor or the associate pastors may not be there for everyone. Right? So, so fellowship is important, where they're able to minister to each other. That's why we have life groups. Right? Life groups is a beautiful place of fellowship. Right? So especially if you look at APC, we are, we are a bigger church, but uh, we have about 43 life groups. So all of them meet in groups. This fellowship, and sometimes we don't even know what they're doing, right? Sometimes they are like, you know, what they're doing in the sense, you know, they go out for badminton, they go out for prayer walks, uh, you know, apart from their regular life group meetings. So they're building fellowship that way, right? And thirdly, sorry, fifthly, equipping of the ministry for ministry. Eventually, even as we do the discipleship, uh, you know, prayer and worship, fellowship. Uh, uh, you know, the word and the spirit, our goal is to get people to step into ministry. Now, when I say step into ministry, it's not like they have to quit their job and come to ministry. What it means is, wherever they are, they're equipped. Remember what Paul Peter says, 1 Peter 3.15, be ready to give an apologia, that means a defense, for the hope that is within you. So Paul is saying, you, Peter is saying, you got to be ready to give a defense. Now you're in the workplace, okay? And they say, uh, so for example, you're in the workplace and somebody comes to you and asks, hey, what is this mark of the beast and all of this, you know, antichrist stuff? Now as a believer, I must be ready to give an apology, a defense. And so that's what we want to see in all the believers. You know, uh, some of them may think, hey, why are we doing all this end times and all? We are equipping people. 
we need to help them understand you should know it yes grace faith you know love holy spirit all of these are our foundations we must also be ready to give a defense for the gospel so we are equipping people get them to understand get them to learn right then even even in 22 august 22 yes uh, august we did faith and science so it was, it was a, there was a lot of things that we had to learn uh, even before we deliver the sermons uh, but it was wonderful why is it important we see that people use science they say i don't know now look at the scientific world you know it, it's it's not something that there's no god but then we are using science to point people to christ get them to understand hey, even science points to a creator right and so what are we doing we're equipping people for ministry now we're not just doing it on our own strength we equip the believers in the supernatural work of the holy spirit we encourage the believers especially a church congregation to begin to flow and begin to tap into the work of the holy spirit there's only so much that we can do as leaders now i can tell you right as a teacher i, I can teach i'm teaching now after teaching we'll move on the course also will get over you will go to the third year also if you have to right but it's only what we teach but it's how much you want to take in have you heard of that saying you can take a horse to the water you can't make it drink can you tell the horse drink drink now he will drink when he wants to drink the same way we we make resources available we equip believers we encourage them but as believers they need to take up you need to take it up say okay god i want to learn i want to grow right uh, and, and so that's when you, you you know the the congregation comes in but we do our part now even as a preacher as a uh, you know as a person who's ministering or teaching don't be discouraged when people are not responding or reacting to what you're doing remember leadership you're sowing seeds you're doing the work right? it may look like nobody's interested it's okay keep doing it because that's our responsibility right to equip people for the ministry right so these are you know just uh, five ways where we help people grow in the word and the spirit now how do we prepare for pulpit ministry how many of us like pulpit ministry what nobody likes pulpit ministry <laughs> it's it's another thing to go and stand on the stage stand on the pulpit and preach it's exciting it's nothing wrong in it it's good to visualize it for yourself it's good to dream about it and think about it and eventually become a pulpit preacher but how do i prepare for it right uh, how do i there are there are practical things there are spiritual things involved how do i prepare for pulpit ministry you know because sometimes we may think i'll do it this way but when you go on the pulpit it's another story altogether and i can share so many examples right so let's look at a few ways of preparing for the pulpit ministry right uh we're going to keep uh, these five areas in mind right what we talked about the word uh discipleship prayer and worship fellowship and equipping of the ministry this is our goal for pulpit ministry so how do i prepare uh right remember that pulpit ministry to stand behind each opportunity we have to stand behind the pulpit and to minister god's word and the work of the Holy Spirit must be done in a definite purpose, meaning there should be a reason why I'm going and preaching on Sunday. You know, last yesterday we had a wonderful sermon on, uh, you know, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the mark of the beast. So I was listening to a lot of sermons, I was listening to a lot of messages, going back to Daniel, because it's quite, uh, you know, there's so many things involved. Going back to the book of Daniel, trying to read it, trying to understand, going back to history, going back to the sermon notes. So there was a lot of study that was involved, but I enjoyed it. I enjoy these topics, I enjoy to study and learn. So we are not just filling up time on a Sunday service. 
we are nurturing people in these five areas that we just talked about. That's what we want to see. Right? So now, for example, you know, I was I was really happy because after church yesterday, many of them came to me and said, you know what, I believe in the mid-tribulation, or I believe that the Antichrist is going to come from here. Or uh, you know. And I was happy and I was glad because they were all listening to the sermon, even though it's a complicated and you know it's so much of detail and material involved, they were all listening to it. And, and I was so engrossed in that sermon that I went on till about 10, 15, I crossed time. But nobody's, everyone was like so focused. On, and it was so exciting to preach these kind of sermons. So remember that, you know, even as you preach, it's you're nurturing people. It gives them an opportunity to learn. It gives them an opportunity to, you know, go back and think about what they've studied, right? So. Some of the three areas that we can balance teaching and preaching of the word of God. Right? How do we balance it? Number one, Christian life. Teaching people how to live a Christian life. And I think you may have definitely heard this saying. Practice what you... Pra again, practice what you... Don't preach and then practice. Practice what you preach, right? So if I am going to go stand on the pulpit, I need to have practiced what I'm preaching, meaning I need to develop disciplines, prayer, reading of the word of God, walking in faith, walking in authority, understanding your identity. You know, sometimes, remember, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but we are not the same. We may wake up with different moods. Today, I may wake up and feel like a pastor. Tomorrow I may wake up and feel like, you know, like a like somebody who's a opposite of the pastor. Next day I may feel, get up and feel like, oh man, life is so boring. Another day I may feel, oh, life is very interesting. Just giving an example, right? So I need to develop this disciplines of prayer and reading of the word of God. I need to do it. There's a sacrifice involved. Right? If you are called to pulpit ministry, you have to sacrifice. It's not for the faint-hearted. Meaning, it's not for people who want to just relax and enjoy. Sorry to say that. Pulpit ministry calls for sacrifice. So I have to be able to, you know, don't look at what others are doing. Hey, they are doing this, no, so even I can do it, no. God is calling you for this. You have to sacrifice. Right? There are, there, you may have to get up early in the morning, start praying. Hey, but all my friends in college are waking up only at uh, 5 o'clock. So what? You do what, if God is calling you, you, you have to sacrifice. Yes or no? Am I wrong? Am I wrong? When the Bible college, uh, when I was in Bible college, the waking up time was 5 a.m. So I used to wake up 5 a.m. and pray. Then I, re sorry? Yeah, APC's Bible college. Uh, 5 a.m., wake up. So I chose to stay in the hostel so that if I stay at home, then I'll be doing all kinds of things. So I chose to stay for at least a year in the hostel. So 5 a.m., prayer. I used to wake up and pray. Then I realized this is not enough. By the time I say thank you for the sun, moon, stars and all that, uh, one hour is over. Thank you for family. Thank you for brother, sister, uh, food, all those things. One hour is over. So I realized this is not enough. I have to be able to do something more if I have to be able to, you know, if I, if I want to lead the worship or preach the word. This is not enough. I just knew it. I said, okay, 4 a.m. No, no, 4 a.m., okay. Now the 4 a.m. also, okay, so we'll finish prayer. But reading of the word is not happening. So what do you do? Okay, 3 a.m. Now everyone is snoring. Everyone are deep sleep. I would wake up, you know, finish prayer, 3 to about 5.30, pray. 5.30 to 6, read the word. 
Now everyone knew. My classmates knew. Sometimes some of them will get up. Sometimes they will not get up. But do you think I care what people think? I didn't care what they think. I didn't care whether they like it or not. The rule was what? 5 a.m. 5 a.m. is not enough for me. If I have to be in a place where I have to teach the word of God, I have to lead people in worship, minister to people, I have to sacrifice. And I realized it, and, and I do it, and I still keep doing it. It's a habit now. Whether there's alarm or no, 3 o'clock, I'm up. Whether I sleep at 10 o'clock, whether I sleep at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, I'm up. At times, it's, it's just 3, 4 hours of sleep. That's okay. Sacrifice. I can't do this when I'm 60 years old. No, do it now. You get what I'm saying, right? So I want to encourage you. Don't, don't, don't look at what others are doing. God is calling you. You look at what you have to do, right? So develop these disciplines, prayer, reading of the word, too. Life skills, teaching people how to live by God's word in daily life, right? So now you've developed it, right? Now you teach people, hey, these are the things I did, right? Now you could be a morning person, you could be a night person. If you're a night person, right, stay night and pray, whatever, whatever works for you. But you begin to teach what you learn. So you go into places. Firstly, you, you know, maybe in your cell groups. Maybe in your uh, if if you're already serving in the church and your volunteer teams, right? And then schools, colleges, uh, in your office, in careers, uh, how to handling handle finances. You begin to learn all of this, and you have to teach it to others, right? There is see one one thing I always say is it's not like we know everything. Right? Just because we are teaching here doesn't mean we know everything. There are things that we are also learning, right? If you look at AI and if you look at things that are happening around, I don't know much of it. All I know is you want to paraphrase, put your content, put it, paraphrase, AI will give you a nice thing. You copy, paste, send it. Neat. Sounds good, looks good, professional. Nothing wrong in that. Right? Uh, but I don't know too much of detail, you know, about AI and all. But I would I want to learn? Yes, I want to learn. Right? So what I learn, I should be able to teach it to others life skills right three ministry teaching people how to minister and serve others with the anointing of god and the gifts of the spirit very important teach people how to serve one of the things that stuck with me at a very young age i was uh, i think it was 2010 i was scheduled to lead worship in APC, one of the churches, and uh, uh, I was 23 years old, 23, 24, or, and I went to lead worship. Nobody had come that day to church. Okay, so I went there, we set up everything, and it was a rainy day that morning. Uh, I remember it so clearly. And so that Sunday, pastor had to preach, and I had to lead the worship. So, so I think I've shared this many times. Uh, um, I went, it, it's 8 o'clock, 8 to 8.30 was prayer, 8.30, nobody's there, only pastor. So he said, lead the worship. So I led the worship. It's 40, 40 minutes of worship. After that, I finished. He came up, preached for 45 minutes to me alone. We closed the church, came to Central. That stuck with me. That was like something that really stuck with me. And I realized that if you have to do something, you do it. Right? So teaching people how to minister can also be by these small things. Right? I remember the first time I was preaching and uh, I was fully excited, took a printout. I made a mistake. I didn't staple it. So I took all the printouts and I went there fully confident. And then, you know, Pastor came and sat in front. I forgot everything because I was still a Bible college student. I, I think I was. It was 2011. I was a Bible college student, so first year, first semester. He said, "You preach." I was so nervous. Right, and and what happened was the fan was on, the papers went flying everywhere. 
when somebody came, you know, one of the came gave me all the papers. He said, continue. I thought, what a terrible mistake this is. And everything went so bad, I'll never get an opportunity. Next Sunday, again, I was preaching. I realized that, you know, of course, I was, you know, they gave me feedback how to do it. Now, if that was not done, what would have happened? Firstly, I thought I'll run away from this place. I didn't want to come back. It is so embarrassing. Imagine you're holding the mic with those and everything goes flying away and everyone are watching you. And that was supposed to be a 45 minute sermon. I think I finished it in 20, 25 minutes because I was too nervous. But the thing is, you learn from these mistakes. And as leaders, we give them the grace, the grace that I received. I must be able to give that same grace to others. Right? So that's what we must do. Uh, but one of the things we do is we keep a watch on what we preach and teach from the pulpit, right? Uh, uh, it, it couldn't become a place of just, you know, talking about oneself, building up one person. No, we, we should stick to what is the topic, make sure that people are able to understand it. Um, you know, if it's, that's why uh, in APC, all our locations, north, south, east, west, central, we follow the same sermon. The way we deliver it may be different, but the same sermon is preached. Right? And we ensure that we give a good 45 to 50 minutes for the sermon. Right? So a church where people are of one heart and one mind. Let's read 1 Corinthians 1.10. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.10. It's in your book I, itself. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there may be no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and in thought. Yeah. So Paul is writing to the Corinthians and saying, I plead with you, brothers. You know, now I, I have a feeling that he's, oh man, these guys are doing something, so much of division. And he's saying, I plead with you, brethren, because later on he goes on to explain what divisions were there in the church. Right? I plead with you in the name of the Lord Jesus that you all speak the same thing. That means be in one mind, that there be no divisions and perfectly join together in same mind and same judgment, meaning one heart and one mind. As a church, it's very important. Teach people to be kingdom-minded, to do things with pure motives, and to give glory to God. Encourage people to work in teams. These are some things that we always do. right? We teach people to be kingdom-minded. That's why we have a book also, Kingdom Builders, and we've done many, many conferences uh, uh, all across our nation of India, uh, Kingdom Builders. Hey. Yes, we have our own church, we have our own ministries, but we all must be kingdom-minded. We should have, we should think about building God's kingdom. It's not only about our, ourselves, right? That's one thing. Two is we do things with pure motives. We don't do Kingdom Builders Conference so that people will get to know APC. We don't do youth conference missions, missions all of this so people will get to know us. It is for us to impact others. Right? It's not so that APC becomes popular. No, it's about us being able to impact others, pure motives, right? So that, see, the, the facilities that we have, the teaching that we have, we know that it's not available in North India. This kind of teaching and in depth going into deep, uh, you know, uh, studies, it's not there. So we want to make it available. That's the pure motive that we have, right? There's no other motive. We're not going there to start our own kind of ministry there. No, we want to reach out minister, help people grow, right? And then constantly encourage people to work together in teams, combine each other's strength. Now in APC, especially as an organization, uh, as staff, we work in teams and I've shared many examples, right? We work in teams. It's not possible to work single-handedly. When we succeed, the team wins. When there is something that doesn't go well, the team gets the blame or, or, or the team has to work on it, right? It's not one per So if one person in the team makes a mistake, the entire team, you know, holds, uh, takes responsibility for that. 
You get what I'm saying, right? So it's not like we are a team only when good things happen. No, we should remain a team even when things are not going our way. When we make mistakes, remember, we are still a team. Right? Jesus didn't say, I know that Judas is going to betray me. Let's get him out of here fast. No, we still knew. We've got to stay together. We are a team. Right? Celebrate each other's success and create a teamwork. Create this culture of teamwork. Right? Okay, so uh, we'll stop here. We'll take a break and we'll come back and continue.